Good morning, everyone. This is a little bit like uh, speed dating this morning. Um, my name's Stuart Jones. I'm a uh, respiratory and sleep specialist at, at Middlemore Hospital. I do wear a, a couple of other hats uh, just to declare. I'm also the, um, the medical director of the uh, Asthma and Respiratory Foundation New Zealand uh, and also the current um, uh, what am I? Uh, president of the um, Thoracic Society here in, here in New Zealand. Um, I've been given the impossible task of providing an update in asthma and vaping in 10 minutes. Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a talk and I've just basically spent uh, the last wee while just culling, 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 and unfortunately I've had to remove all the jokes as part of that, so sorry about that. Hey, um, 10 minutes isn't long, so it's going to be very, very brief. I think the main, the main things, if I can get them out right at the beginning, is, is in terms of asthma, um, I want to, to highlight three things. Number one, the importance of being as certain as you can about the diagnosis as early as you can. Uh, number two is inhaled corticosteroids are still king uh, when it comes to asthma management. Uh, and number three is in the, in the patients who are at a high risk of exacerbations, uh, the use of single inhaler maintenance and reliever therapy is, ha is very effective and should be considered. Um, those are the three key points for asthma. The one key point for vaping is if you don't smoke, don't vape. Uh, it's, it's not going to be good for your lungs. Right, it's my... Oh. <laughs> Alright, so, so where are we? Look, um, last year uh, we, we put out the New Zealand guidelines, New Zealand asthma guidelines. Uh, put out by the foundation. You guys should be all very well aware of this. This was put out at the beginning of last year. I'm not going to talk to this one in particular today because that was last year's news. Other than the fact that GINA have come out with their new guidelines this year and in many ways what GINA is saying is actually supporting some of the things that we'd said in, in the New Zealand guidelines actually. So I think the New Zealand guidelines still remain very relevant and, and a very useful tool. So I encourage you to, to continue to, to use them. Asthma, uh, as you know, it's a, it's a heterogeneous dis disease, unfortunately. Uh, it's characterised by, by chronic airway inflammation and it's defined by this history of respiratory symptoms uh, such as wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness, cough, but it's that variable course. It's that variable course that, 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 that gives a clue that, that asthma is going on. Plus, it's, it is associated with documented levels of variable expiratory airflow limitation. Okay, and so when it comes to diagnosing asthma, um, the, 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 the uh, New Zealand guidelines have, have these big arrows going up and down, which I'm sure many of you will be well aware and that when it comes to diagnosing asthma, it's all about, there is, no, there is no gold standard one test that confirms above everything else. It's all about putting all the bits of the information together. It's all about the, the, the probability of it based on these symptoms, the variability n nature of them, uh, their uh, association with various triggers, um, and then also building into that the, the ability of of, of documenting some airflow obstruction which is variable over time. And then there's other factors that, that argue against it such as a long smoking history, an older age, symptoms just on exertion and things like that which are suggesting other things like COPD going on. The, um, the GINA guidelines that, that come out it basically said again just reinforce that same thing that the diagnosis of asthma should be based on, on the, the characteristic history, which is that variable nature, triggers being involved and things like that, and evidence of reversible airflow obstruction. Um, the, the other thing that both guidelines are saying is that it's, it's important to get as much information early on as you can, because once you've started people on treatment, particularly inhaled steroids and things like that, the the, 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 uh, the degree of airflow obstruction will, will change. Now, if you want to do that as documenting, clear 
differences in airflow obstruction, then that's fantastic. But it means you've still got to get some results right at the beginning before you start the treatment so you then can compare back to. So getting access to good spirometry uh, in the community is key. Um, and uh, I know a number of practices have already got spirometers in there. If you don't, I would encourage you to be able to, to do that. Um, the other thing though is you can have a spirometer, it needs to be getting good, give, giving good results and uh, the Thoracic Society is currently uh, just finalising um, uh, a spirometry competency uh, uh, which will be rolled out into the community to try and help improve the, the, the competency of the spirometry being done and improve the, the, the spirometry that is, that is out there so it gives you guys reliable uh, reliable figures to be looking at. So that's on the diagnosis of asthma. As we said right at the beginning, it is an inflammatory condition of the airways, but you don't have to document airway inflammation to come up with that diagnosis. Uh, sure, there's things like exhaled nitric oxide and things like that are available, and the GINA guidelines actually have now incorporated exhaled nitric oxide into it, saying that in a steroid naive patient, if they've got high exhaled nitric oxide, it's highly likely that they're going to have a uh, uh, that, that they're going to be responsive to inhaled corticosteroids. So, in terms of the management. Uh, you will all be well aware of that stepwise uh, treatment algorithm that is out there where you, you know, as you go to different severities of asthma, you add on further treatments. Um, that is still the same, but there is a lot of pushback uh, happening, particularly at two areas, um, or not pushback, there's one pushback being occurring at step one, whether or not we should even be having a step one, which is short-acting beta agonists alone. Uh, and the other is, is a real push both, uh, and, and now also in the GINA guidelines that people who uh, in step three should be considering single inhal inhaler therapy. In terms of the step one, the problem with step one is that, um, that there, it, it can teach uh, patients that uh, salbutamol is a good medication to have in, in asthma. And then when, when their asthma is bad, we end up saying to them, no, no, you don't want to be taking too much salbutamol. It's actually bad for you and things like that. So the very inhaler we introduced them to right at the beginning is actually the one that we say at the end is, no, no, we don't want you to be taking that one. And there is, there is a lot of, of debate uh, in respiratory at the moment as to whether or not we've actually got this right. And I know that the, 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 the um, latest GINA guidelines, sorry if I just flick through to it, now have step one as incredibly small, and they say in it there is only a small proportion of asthma patients who should be on it on 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 short-acting beta agonists alone, uh, and these are the ones who will be getting symptoms less than once or twice per month, uh, and it actually should be just a small minority of our asthma patients because it's clearly shown that early dose. Low-dose low inhaled corticosteroids will reduce exacerbation risks as well as improving uh, lung function and, um, and symptoms. So Gina have gone for this big, long step two, which is the low dose, and even in their step one, which they've narrowed it right down, they're saying, actually, even there, consider some low-dose inhaled corticosteroids um, in terms of uh, uh, improving the asthma control. The other thing with the GINA guidelines uh, is that they have, um, they have got a, a, a new little update uh, of, of uh, high risk patients. So patients that are a high risk of having uh, exacerbations. And this is the group in particular that we need to be considering uh, um, escalating therapy on. Uh, and so the, the, the high risk factors are again pretty much pretty much exactly what we're saying in our New Zealand guidelines already. So those using high doses of, uh, of short-acting beta agonists, those who have had an exacerbation in the last 12 months, uh, those with uh, high bronchodilator reversibility, and those with other comorbidities such as obesity and smoking and things like that going on. And, and they've also included this group here people with high exhaled nitric oxide despite inhaled corticosteroids. We haven't really got easy access to it at the moment, um, but that may be something that, that changes. But 
what this is good about is that it's just reinforcing again that there is a high group, uh, uh, there is a group of asthmatics that are high risk of of exacerbating, and these ones need to get our attention and be managed carefully. Again, as I said, in the GINA guidelines, um, they talk about adding in the, the combination of inhaled steroids and long-acting beta agonists, which has been around for a long time. Um, but interestingly, the GINA guidelines have actually come out, as New Zealand guidelines have said, and said, actually, when you weigh up the evidence, once you get into this, this group that's a high risk of exacerbation, that the single therapy, single, single inhaler therapy for maintenance and reliever, uh, using a fomoterol quick long-acting bronchodilator, so in New Zealand, for us, it's cell, uh, Simbicort, but overseas, there are other combinations available with not only budesonide, but e beclomethazone and things like that involved as well. They are key because it, the, the patient is then taking that extra dose of inhaled steroids when they're symptomatic without having to think about it. And so it's getting the airway inflammation under control and treating their asthma. The last couple of slides on, on asthma is I just want to draw your attention to MABs in New Zealand. Um, the monoclonal antibodies are uh, coming to, to asthma management and the results from the studies are, are saying that, that they, could be, they could be game changers in terms of the treatment of, of our severe asthma cohort. Omelizumab has been available in New Zealand for quite some time. Uh, except the Pharmac criteria was so difficult to get anyone on because it required recurrent hospital admissions. And we know that a lot of our severe asthma addicts don't come to hospital. Uh, they're managed in the community with, success, uh, with, with courses of prednisone and things like that. And actually often the ones who do come to hospital have other things going on. Uh, and and you know, it's often other issues like compliance or other comorbidities or social situation and stuff like that that's going on. And as a result, not many people in New Zealand were on omelizumab. Fortunately, Pharmac have listened to the various feedback and so they have now scrapped hospital admissions from their supply criteria, which I think it is, is going to mean we're most probably going to start seeing this used more frequently and it's most probably going to end up coming back to your GP practices for the ongoing doses. It will be a, a, a still a specialised, specialist initiated thing, but the plan, I, th I think, really is, is the fact that the first few doses will be given in specialist centre, and then we should be trying to roll it back out into the community so they don't have to keep on coming in for their monthly uh, subcutaneous injections. The, um, the, the criteria for it, uh, are, while it's unchanged in terms of the ATP, high IgE, and on higher dose inhaled corticosteroids. All right. The other one coming is mepolizumab. This is being considered by Pharmac at the moment, i.e. they're in cost discussions with the company. Um, mepolizumab most probably is even more exciting than omelizumab in terms of the results. I'm really looking forward to us being able to really get our hands on this for our severe asthma cohort. Again, it's a nice subcutaneous injection, affects anti-IL-5 and reduces those eosinophils. Two minutes to discuss vaping. I can't do vaping in two minutes. Other, other than to say that uh, e-cigarettes, it's a very heated topic. And, um, uh, and there's a lot of passion on both sides of the e-cigarette debate. Often when you see there's a lot of passion, it's because there's a lack of evidence. And I think that was very much the case when e-cigarettes came on board. There is more and more evidence coming on board now. Uh, and the evidence uh, is, is suggesting that e-cigarettes will cause airways inflammation. It does affect the uh, function of the alveolar macrophage. It does affect the airways, but it's l likely to have less cancer-causing effect than cigarette smoking. And that is really its saving grace at the moment. Um, the FDA in, in America, if you're keeping watching the news, they are really concerned about this because e-cigarettes came on as being this agent which is going to stop their smokers from smoking. It's now being sort of... Pardon? It's now being promoted to the kids. That's right, and that's the FDA's problem. Uh, they've got things like... Um, uh, the brands like Vampire's Blood, Dragon's Spit, and uh, Unicorn Milk, 
which are ov obviously all highly, highly dedicated to the hardcore smokers who can't quit. Um, the problem is that some of these are being really spiced up with nicotine, some of them containing 30 or 40 times the nicotine level of a single cigarette, and obviously nicotine is addictive, and they are basically creating a new, uh, a new uh, addicted cohort coming through. Um, I think we need to be careful with what we do and what we advise about e-cigarettes. Anyone interested in it, last year, or the, sorry, the beginning of this year, uh, the FDA sponsored a big review by the National uh, um, Sciences, uh, and they put together a 600-page um, document, which is very, very thorough. It's an excellent read if you want to, to, to read and read and read. But <laughs> there is a really nice summary page. There's three pages where they get their, their summaries down into bullet points on strength of evidence. And as far as I'm concerned, that, that's the strongest evidence at the moment. I was hoping to have our TSAN's position paper here today because I'm on the writing committee for that. But we've been just way down with, with all these, uh, the literature that we're reviewing and we're perhaps a couple of months behind our, our target. But it is coming soon. Other than I would just re-emphasise again, e-cigarettes are likely to be less harmful than cigarettes in that they've got less known carcinogens uh, and that's where a lot of this, this promotion about being 95% safer and things like that came out of. But actually the, 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 the data that's coming out and the studies are showing just amount, the same amounts of airway inflammation. So I have great concerns that we may not have the cancer but we're still going to end up with a whole lot of long-term morbidity with it. Will we see it in two or three year follow-up studies? No, we won't. Will we see it in 20 year follow-up studies? Yes, we will. Will it be too late by then? Yes, it will. The, the, the story that we're being told about e-cigarettes is exactly what we're told about cigarettes back uh, last century when we were told they're not going to be harmful, they're going to help relax people, they're going to be good for people and don't worry about them. Uh, we know that Big Tobacco sat on the information saying it was dangerous for well over a decade uh, before it came to light. Um, we know that WHO have said big tobacco shouldn't be invited back to the table because of that behaviour that they had, and yet we know that so much of this e-cigarette stuff are being bought out by big tobacco because they see it's a big industry coming forward and we're in the same position again, so tread carefully. It's okay, it's most probably, best, it's most probably better than smoking cigarettes. I'll give you that. But it's not going to be better for people who don't smoke. It's not going to be better for our adolescents getting their hands on that. Um, and so I think we need to be very clear in, in how we go about saying that it's fine to use. Ten minutes. Thank you.